Good afternoon, everyone. It was uh, just over two years ago that the ATF, <laughs> FBI, and my office joined with the Philadelphia Police Department to form a carjacking force. We came together in response to a troubling spike in these crimes in the city. Unfortunately, these crimes have affected people in neighborhoods all across the city. Our collective hope was that surging uh, federal resources and capabilities would sort of supercharge efforts to stem the tide of violent carjackings and bring the perpetrators to justice. We're here today to update you, the public, on the targeted efforts of our task force in addressing this significant public safety concern in Philadelphia. We want to highlight some successes, give you an idea of some of the work that we're doing, and assure our community that significant strides are being made on your behalf. We also hope that this will serve as a wake-up call for carjackers, would-be carjackers, individuals who up until now might not have thought twice about going out and committing one of these crimes, they'll want to think twice after hearing about our cases. Here's what people need to know. From January of 2022 through March of this year, 59 cases investigated by our carjacking task force have resulted in federal charges. A total of 103 defendants have been federally charged in connection with 121 individual matters. Many have long criminal histories, but others less so, including some offenders very surprised to find themselves on the Fed's radar, first time offenders. In fact, we can we can and we have charged defendants as young as 18 years old. And in some cases, we've prosecuted. We've obtained very significant sentences. These defendants routinely receive sentences of 7 to 15 years and can even face up to a lifetime of imprisonment in some cases. Right now, I can tell you that we have numerous carjacking cases in various stages of prosecution. While we can't discuss our ongoing investigations, we do have several adjudicated cases I'd like to highlight today, cases that uh, have taken some pretty dangerous individuals off of Philadelphia's streets. In a few most recent developments, Deshaun Pringle, who is 27 years old, was sentenced last month to 10 and a half years in prison for carjackings he committed in Center City and West Philadelphia. In the West Philadelphia carjacking, the victim was violently assaulted before he had his wallet, car keys, and vehicle stolen. In the Center City carjacking, Pringle pointed a gun at the face of the victim before taking the victim's keys and vehicle. And just last week, John Nussline pleaded guilty to two violent carjackings targeting food delivery drivers. Horrifically, one of those drivers, a 70-year-old man, was fatally beaten by the carjackers in Northeast Philadelphia. Nussline who's 20 years old, has agreed to plea to 25 years in federal prison. That's five years longer than he has been on this earth. Next month, Angel Fayez and Kevin Anton are due to be sentenced. Fayez is 19 years old and Anton is 20 years old. They previously pled guilty to a 12-day, two-man crime spree, which kicked off with a carjacking in North Philadelphia, followed by seven armed robberies. They are now facing mandatory minimum sentences of seven years in prison and a statutory maximum of life 
in prison. Wrapping up now on a more positive note, carjackings in the city this last year were down 31 percent from 2022. From 1,311 to 900 in 2023. And so far in 2024, from January through this week, there have been 162 carjackings in Philadelphia. Obviously still more than anyone would like, but a number that puts us on pace for another marked decline this year. The work of the task force is clearly being felt across the city and would be carjackers better think twice. Bottom line, none of us, not one of us going about our daily business should have to fear armed criminals sticking guns in our faces, assaulting us, and stealing our cars. That's why my office and our partners on the carjacking task force are working every day to protect the public by identifying, prosecuting, and putting criminals like these out of commission. My message to would-be carjackers is simple. Even though we always look to prosecute the most violent offenders with the lengthiest criminal histories at the federal level, make no mistake about it. You don't have to have a long rap sheet or even any rap sheet for the feds to look at you to go federal. You don't have to be part of some large criminal enterprise for the feds to look at you to go federal. Even if it's just you, by yourself, and you think it's a good idea to use a gun to take someone's car, think again. We will be looking at you to go federal. Now I'll hand things over to Eric Degree, special agent in charge of ATF Philadelphia. He's going to talk about his agency's role on the task force and one of their significant cases. Then we're going to hear from FBI Philadelphia Special Agent in Charge Wayne Jacobs and Philadelphia Police Commissioner Kevin Bethel. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Our team of ATF Special Agents are working tirelessly with our partners in the Philadelphia Carjacking Task Force to seek justice and prevent these dangerous crimes from recurring in our city. Carjacking is not only a deadly dangerous crime, it is a serious federal offense carrying lengthy prison sentences even for first time offenders. One of our task force's first investigations was the Green Laser case. This was called that because of the prominent use of a laser sight equipped firearm by the perpetrators. Two carjackers, Tariq Chambers and Nakeem Leach Hilton, terrorized Philadelphia's Longcrest and Germantown neighborhoods, as well as Springfield Township, Delaware County, with a series of three carjackings which occurred in one evening. While fleeing the police in a high-speed car chase, they crashed into another car, leaving an elderly driver in a coma with life-threatening injuries, including broken bones and serious head trauma. Working with our task force partners, our agents utilize various investigative techniques, including ATF's crime gun intelligence tools to tie these cases together. This investigation also identified other members of this crew, Kassar Lynch and Richard Johnson Price. These two individuals carjacked another three cars in the following eight months. Chambers and Leach were convicted and sentenced to more than 18 years in federal prison for their crimes, while Lynch and Johnson Pierce have also pled guilty and face about a decade each in federal prison when sentenced. The task force goals has been to stave the wave of armed carjackings and violent crimes throughout our combined resources and enforcement techniques. As USAO Jack Romero just stated, we had a promising decline of 30% last year. 
This is a trend that we are working to continue through our investigative work, our partnerships, and the important support and cooperation of Philadelphia's community members. I want to emphasize here that federal carjacking penalties are severe. They include charges of conspiracy, robbery, kidnapping, and various firearms violations. And if a firearm is brandished during a carjacking, it could be a seven-year minimum mandatory sentence, including first-time offenders. It's important for everyone out there to know who thinks they may get away with carjackings because they don't have a prior record to understand that this is a very serious federal crime. We are vigorously pursuing these crimes, and in convicted, you will face a, f a very long federal prison sentence. So looking ahead, we aim to continue the task force success through our combined efforts and to look for opportunities to be even more effective and continue to make Philadelphia neighborhoods safer. I now want to introduce Special Agent in Charge of the FBI, Wayne Jacobs. Thank you, Eric. Carjackings, like any crime of violence, cause direct injury to victims while also impacting the psychology of those who fear they will be next. We at the FBI have now long figured out that to meet these challenges we face in combating these crimes, we must rely upon our partners to pursue the disproportionate few who are responsible for a large percentage of these brazen acts. Dedicated to, as a special agent in charge, I've got the unique privilege to see the work of our dedicated agents and TFOs who put forward the work every single day to significantly reduce the number of carjackings, homicides, and other violent crime incidents across the city. Specific to carjackings, since 2022, our task forces have brought forward 19 cases, resulting in federal carjacking charges. Of these 19 cases, 34 defendants have been charged with a total of 50 carjackings. 12 of these defendants have pled guilty, and seven have been sentenced. This includes a case from March of 2022, when Shamir Young and three co-conspirators committed a carjacking at gunpoint in Northwest Philadelphia, where they pistol whipped one of their victims um, and left them uh, without their vehicle. Mr. Young pled guilty and was sentenced to seven years behind bars. One month later, in April of 2022, 19-year-old Robert Riles and two co-conspirators committed a carjacking at gunpoint of a mother and daughter in West Philadelphia. He has pled guilty and was sentenced to 134 months in prison. These are just two examples of the cases covering offenses committed by individuals of varying ages across the city. Whether a single subject or a group of subjects, with criminal history or without, the message is simple. Your actions have consequences. No matter where you are, the FBI and each agency that stands up here will hold you to account. Thank you, and I'll now introduce the Commissioner of the Philadelphia Police Department, Kevin Bethel. Oops, sorry. Sorry. So, so good afternoon, everyone. I just want to be begin by first thanking, you know, U.S. Attorney Romero and my colleagues to my right and my left, the FBI and ATF, uh, for their support. Uh, I, I oftentimes uh, th think the individuals don't really understand uh, the task force and, and the roles of responsibility. And I know many of those men and women are behind the cameras today. I want to thank you uh, because at the end of the day, it's your work that really culminates in what we talk about up here today. And I just want to share my appreciation for you. I mean, we understand. I just came back into the policing uh, after 100 days in this space now, but also lived in uh, for the last seven years that fear. That, that was described by the U.S. Attorney, you know, and understanding uh, what it means when you put a task force together and because of the, the sheer level of crimes and activity we were seeing across the city. And, and so when I see my colleagues here today working with my individuals here to create this task force, to really target those individuals, and but most importantly, getting results. I mean, I think they all described the reductions in the carjackings from last year and the trend we're seeing this year, that is all because of the work that collectively the task force is putting together as well as my men and women in the field to bring these cases forward. And so we're very, very appreciative of that. As you know, the mayor, as part of my charge, challenged me to work 
and with my federal partners. And I can tell you they have made it extremely easy as I've onboarded into this process of understanding how we can work collaboratively. I just released a 100-day plan, and one of the large paragraph is exactly what you see here, working in partnership with my federal colleagues and the U.S. Attorney to make a difference in the community that we serve. And so we are internally grateful for your support and executing effectively to be able to bring these individuals who harm harm to our community uh, each and every day. And so I just want to say on behalf of the Philadelphia Police Department, on behalf of the mayor, on behalf of the men and women I walk, who walk the street every day trying to protect the city and the community at large, thank you for the efforts you're putting forth to help us make the city safe. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Like you, I'm, I'm very proud of the work of not just the carjacking task force, but the various partnerships we've had on a lot of issues. Um, however, there's certainly more work to be done. The public should rest assured that our agencies are going to push ahead together in our effort to stop these and other violent crimes, seek punishment for the offenders, and justice for the victims. Uh, we'll take some questions now, and if you're directing your question at a specific person, please let us know. And again, I'd like to just remind you that we are limited on what we can say about pending cases. So. Can you emphasize the fact when we looked at the data here, you said this started about two years ago. Two years ago, from 2022, in that first year, you're saying that there's, you know, between 2022 and 2023, a 31% drop. Just emphasize to us how important you think this task force was at getting that number down drastically. Um, I, I think we were very important, not just the work of the task force, but all of our offices have put a lot of time and effort into community engagement, um, meeting with community groups, meeting with youth in our communities, and educating the community about the consequences of committing federal crimes, um, as well as for, for our youth, alternatives to getting involved in crime. And I think it's been a community effort all around in addition to the work of this task force. Certainly enforcement is, is one of the most important things here. When people have guns put in their face and their car stolen, we're going to enforce. We're going to come after you and we're going to hold you responsible. But there's so much other work that has been going on behind the scenes by all of these agencies. We're out there in the community every day working with our community partners to educate and um, uh, get the assistance of the community in solving these crimes. Could you provide some examples of the collaboration that takes place between these offices, um, as well as perhaps some of the collaboration that might be even happening with border and states as well? I mean, the collaboration is a daily thing. It's, it is hard to even quantify. When I tell you our phones ring off the hook, as do their phones, we're constantly communicating. We sit down, we crunch numbers, we share data, uh, we talk about where the hot spots are in the city, um, what tools we have, not just through law enforcement, but social services and, and other entities. Um, and we come together and talk about solutions. At the end of the day, the public is looking for solutions. They're looking for numbers to come down, and that's what we've been committed to. I, I mean, Kensington is of mind to everyone. The 22nd District is certainly something I, I think Commissioner can speak to the efforts uh, that the mayor is rolling out there. We have offered all of our services to that district. We've been having meetings with uh, the commissioner. We'll have an upcoming meeting with the mayor and um, are happy to lend our federal resources to that effort. I don't know if you want to speak to the, the Kensington. <clears throat> efforts. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, as you know, we're going to bark on a significant effort in Kensington. I think oftentimes, uh, though we, we know it to be an open-air drug market and we kind of label that, it, it is one of the most violent pockets in the city of Philadelphia as well. And so uh, as I've already met with my, my federal colleagues to, to really outline what our strategy be, or will be. Uh, we will be focusing at 10 districts across the city that have almost 77 percent of the violence but within that, there's subsets of pockets within those uh, grids that are, have represents almost 30 percent of that violence. So as, as, as the U.S. Attorney indicated, we're going to be very data-driven, but we can't do this by ourselves. I need the collaborative work of all the federal agencies, you know, two that are here, three that are here, as well as others uh, across the spectrum to help us uh, to reduce the crime across the city. I think 
We can't stand here without acknowledging, um, unfortunately, that a lot of the violent crimes we're seeing across the city involve juveniles. Um, my, it's very rare for, for DOJ as an office to certify a juvenile to be prosecuted as an adult. Those are uh, the most egregious of cases where that happens. And so the focus of my office has been on um, youth engagement. We've hired a youth coordinator who 24 hours a day is focused on being out in the community, in the schools, at the rec centers, talking to our youth. We have um, developed a set of uh, sort of playing cards that prompt questions for youth that we use in the rec centers and in the schools. Uh, it's called High Minded. And it gets uh, these young folk talking about the issues that are impacting them every day and um, getting some really crucial conversations to happen. Um, I've uh, stood up a future assistant U.S. attorney program, a summer program, a one week long program in my office where we bring in, uh, last year we had 50 young uh, high school students who came in and learned about the federal experience as well as um, potentials for career in law enforcement, in the judiciary, they met with our judges. Um, so that's just a little flavor of some of the things we're doing. These folks here also have incredible programs uh, that they're running with our youth. Even though our focus as feds is not necessarily the youth, we can't stand here without recognizing that a lot of the crimes are being committed by juveniles and we are committed to the solution. We're committed to educating these youth and giving them options um, and hope that they see for themselves their future careers. Um, I, I mean, we could speculate a million um, reasons. When I was a kid, joyriding, right? You took your parents' car and went out for a joyride. I think uh, cars are attractive to young kids. Uh, the idea of being free in a vehicle um, out on the street is something that, that, that kids you know, are attracted to. We also see a lot of adults luring uh, kids in, uh, adults who are, are part of larger rings of, of uh, stealing cars and selling them for profit and um, thinking it's, it's easier to try and lure the kids in to, to assist them and cheaper to, to get kids to help out. But we could speculate all day long why kids are attracted to it. My message is don't get involved in the first place because the, the consequences of these crimes are tremendous. When we're talking about 20 year old going away for 25 years of their life, you just don't want to be there. And that's my message to our youth is just find other ways to occupy your time and, and get involved in our programs. We've got a million programs for youth that we're all uh, standing up so that they have other options. I'm, I'm not a sociologist. I don't know if any of you want to speculate why. The, I mean, everyone loves to blame COVID. Why it went up and now coming down. Why did, yeah, what caused the... Well, I, mean, I think yeah. when, when we look at the crime across the, across the board, we are seeing a natural trend back to pre-COVID numbers. We're seeing that in our homicide numbers. We're seeing that even across the board now in our rapes and robberies and other offenses, we're seeing a trending back to the COVID, pre-COVID numbers. So I, I think that's, you know, just a year after COVID where we see the spike and then now we're seeing over the last two years, you know, some of those numbers starting to come back down. Yeah, but early to your point about juveniles, I will deal with the adolescent development and a child's brain is not fully developed stealing a car. But it takes a little bit more effort when you're now going to grab a gun, stick it in someone's face and take their weapon or, or even injure them in that process. And so um, I'm glad that the work that the U.S. Attorney's Office is doing and we're going to be very laser focused on those individuals who do harm to, to our community. Um, so. Have you seen uh, youth who are involved in, in, in carjacking have more like assault weapons, more like guns? I, I mean, I'm in the juvenile space. I, I don't have the analysis of, of that. I mean, clearly, you know, we're seeing a number of our juveniles with weapons. Uh, just the other day at our Ed celebration, I mean, we got some significant firepower from, from kids who are only 15 years old. And, and so uh, I can't speak specifically to that, but we do see a number of our young people with, with weapons. You talked about the natural progression of data going down. Do you keep this task force going? When's, when's the end point for this task force? It's a 
<laughs> there, there may be a never-ending point is what the commissioner is saying. Uh, we're going to follow the data and follow the numbers and where there's a need in a particular area where we have a spike in crime, we're going to be there. Look, I, I can. I can't step in the shoes of a victim. That, that uh, experience and what people go through, the trauma after having something like this happen to them is tremendous. Anyone who's been a victim of crime in the city, myself included, my home was broken into years ago, um, and it, it took me a long time to get over that break-in. Um, so I can't step in the shoes and, and describe for you what these victims are going through. Uh, working with the victims, I can tell you it's horrific. And for some people, they may never get over that kind of an experience. Um, if we're, we're close to wrapping up, thank you. Thank you all. We really appreciate you coming out and helping us get the word out today. I don't want, I'm, I'm in her home base and I, I don't want this to turn into my press conference. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, we have a lot of video that we're sorting through. Um, and we have a number of individuals in, 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 uh, under arrest now. Uh, we have some video to showing other individuals with weapon. Uh, my team is working through that process now to identify them. And if identified, we'll make a, be making additional arrests. Are you able to stand on the other people you're looking at? I'm not able to speak at this time. Uh, yeah, that the investigation is still in its early stages, not able to tell you the root cause at this point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we're going to make that the last question. We've got folks who have to um, be elsewhere. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you very much. much.